just going to try to paper a couple times. favorite quotes, right? So, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I truly believe in that. I believe that we live in a world which is full of magic. Because magic is possible because of technology. It's possible because of machines. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Right? So, uh, way back, uh, I want to say about 10 years back, one of my closest friends was diagnosed with a very, very rare form of cancer. Uh, it was a very, very difficult time for all of us. Went to multiple different kinds of doctors, worked through all of the possible options that we could, but it never really worked out. About a couple of years ago, one of the doctors that we were working with gave us a call. And he actually said that he wanted to try to use machines to see how we could help the friend. That seemed very fascinating for all of us, but we didn't really understand what he meant. But what he wanted to do was essentially he wanted to sequence the DNA and RNA of his cancer cells and compare them to DNA and RNA. Sense. To try and find out what is the difference, if there is any difference, how can we solve it? What was fascinating was that when this exercise was undertaken, we actually found that there was a very, very small, simple protein which was causing the growth of this cancer cells. Now, admittedly, it was not the easiest thing to find. It was not the most commercially viable option for us, but we did it. My friends are right today. And that was because of science and technology that actually empowers all of us. So if you actually think about why is this happening or how is this possible, it's actually possible because of a simple thing called genome sequencing. Something that did not exist in the late 2000s. Right? It's possible today and it's possible at the liquid switching process. Less than 2000 actually to get your whole human genome sequenced. And when that actually happened, because the immense amount of data that got generated because of this, all of that data was essentially put through something which is very, very dear to my heart for machine learning. And that's really how it was possible. Right? And a lot of us hear about this term machine learning, everybody thinks about machine learning. We don't really um, have a common construct about machine learning. So let's just take a couple of minutes and think about what machine learning is. Right? Let's do a brain experiment. Uh, I'm going to take an example which is provided by one professor, Pedro Domingos, from the University of Washington. Right? So if you think about a fundamental construct of computation, if you actually think any computation that actually happens in the world, it falls into a very simple model. And the model is something like this. You want to automate a task or you want to get an output, so you actually create a set of instructions. You create an algorithm. You say, this is what I want back, right? So let's call that picture as the algorithm. You combine that with data. You have a bunch of data that you actually have. And then you put it into a machine, and then you have an output. What essentially happens here is you take a set of instructions, you run the instructions on a set of data, and you get an output. That's really how the whole world of computation works. Anything that you see as far as computation is concerned, that's how it's working, right? Now let's take an example of what that looks like. Um, let's take an MRI scan because I started with a cancer example. So let's take a uh, talk about that. So you think of an MRI scan and you figure out a way to actually go and look at the MRI scan and figure out if it has a tumor or not. That's your algorithm. You have your MRI, MRI scan itself. That's your data. And you put both of them through the machine and you're going to get an output which is going to say, yep, this MRI has a tumor or it doesn't have a tumor. That's, that's the traditional way of doing computation, right? So machine learning kind of shifts this whole paradigm on its head. Let's see what that means. Now you have a bunch of data. You combine that data with an output. You basically say, here's my data, but here's the output I want from the data. And you put that into the machine, and now the beauty happens. Where the machine actually figures out what the algorithm for that is. Now let's look at what that means in real time, right? So what this actually means is, now you have a bunch of data like MRI scans. You have a lot of MRI scans. And then you also have a list that says, for a given MRI scan, does it actually have a tumor or not? So you actually have the output already with you. And you put that into the machine, and the machine now magically figures out a pattern of how it can recognize whether that given scan has a tumor or not. And what are the implications of doing something like this? You can actually train this entire machine in 30 minutes. Now, what that essentially means is multiple years of medical training can actually be done in 30 minutes in some form or fashion. That means now you're suddenly very, very cost effective and at scale. And the other beauty that becomes out of this is if you actually design it right, then your learning model which you got out of your computer can actually generate more learning models. Now what does that mean in real world terms? Just think about this for a second. Right? Typically in computation, all you did is you said, here is the work that I want to get done. You write an instruction for it, the computer does the work for you. 
if you want to do something else, then you have to write a new set of instructions. An example is, if you wanted to detect tumor, you're going to give them an algorithm for tumor. But if you wanted to drive cars, you're going to give it an algorithm to drive cars. But the beauty of something like machine learning is, if you actually generate an algorithm which learns, it can learn anything. Which means, I do the work once, and it starts learning all the concepts. That's the beauty of what is the world going to work. That's what we're all going to do, right? And that's why my friends are also. So if you think about it, you're doing it at scale, you're doing it in a very cost-effective manner, and you see this manifestation of machine learning everywhere in the world. It's just all around the world, right? You may not notice it, it's, it's very ubiquitous. It's fairly happening everywhere. If you think about it, it happens in speech recognition, whether you use an iPhone and C, whether you use Cortana and Microsoft, whether you use Google Now, all of the voice recognition is actually called by machine learning. You have gesture recognition, machine learning. Data security, machine learning. Uh, fraud payments, anywhere that you go, you go to uh, Amazon, you try to pay a credit card bill, anywhere, these are priced to validate that your credit card's running. All of that is machine learning. Search technologies, Google, Apple, everybody searches using machine learning. And most importantly, all of your commerce actually runs on machine learning. So machine learning is very ubiquitous in anything and everything that you see. So given that construct, what's so special about what we're talking about? I mean, it seems to be fairly iterative, we're all getting better, life is getting better, but why is it so important to talk about? That is a Go board. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this game Go, but something really interesting happened this year. Till about last year, if you'd ask anybody in computer science or anybody who's any kind of game theorist, they would have said a machine defeating a Go player was at least a big game. 10 years ago. But this year, a machine called AlphaGo defeated the world's best Go player. Not once, not twice, but four times out of five. Now why is that so important? It's important because Go is without question one of the most complex things anybody can ever do. Now to put that in context, why is it complex? Because a Go board has 10 to the power of 170 board positions. What does that mean? Number looks huge, fine. What does that mean? So let's do a mind mapping exercise of how complex Go is, right? Uh, this is our observable universe. Right? This is the universe we live in. Now it has been calculated that in our universe there are 10 to the power of 80 atoms. Right? So in our observable universe there are 10 to the power of 80 atoms. That's a lot of atoms. Right? Now there is another theory which is called the theory of multiverses. They are saying that there is just not one universe, there are actually many, many universes. Right? So now let's for a second assume that there are 10 to the power of 80 universes. Right? Which means you have as many universes as there are number of atoms in our universe. Right? Now if you actually combine all of those numbers and say that I take all atoms in all of these universes of multiverses, that gives you 10 to the power of 160, which is still less than the number of combinations that are possible on a whole world. It's just a very convoluted way of saying it's a very complicated way. Nothing more than that. So if you actually think about what that means, is what ended up happening is it was very special when a machine could do something like this. Why? Because it's physically impossible for you to program a machine to actually go and do so many combinations. It would take you years to actually build a machine like this. But the machine was able to do this and beat a person because it started thinking like human beings. Right? So with the power of observation, because it observed many, many Go games happening, and experience by playing the game against itself, it actually did what humans are very good at doing, which is to feel whether a given move is right or not. Now think about that for a second. That's a fundamental shift from how machines actually behave. We all want to be in this world, it's a nice world where we behave, we want to think that machines cannot feel. But the truth is, the fact that a person was being beaten at Go, who was a champion, four times, means the machine starts feeling something. It starts thinking about whether it's the right move or not, not by doing pure computation, but by observation and experience. And that is a fundamental shift. What does that shift actually result in? Right? It results in something called as an exponential growth. So if you actually think about human potential, human performance, we grow linear. We're very good at evolution, we've always grown linear, right? But computers are actually growing exponentially now, and we're right there at that cusp. And I believe that victory of the AlphaGo machine over a human is exactly that, right? It's that cusp. So the world is changing, and how is it changing? If you actually see, I don't go to an accountant and do my taxes anymore. It's all automated. I do it through you know, software. So accountants are not needed anymore. What also happens is there is this beautiful chatbot, which has now come in Seattle as well, it used to be in New York and London, which has successfully fought more than, actually this is slightly older, it's fought more than 200,000 parking tickets, right? So I got a parking ticket, I have a parking violation, I go to the bot and the bot actually fights my case. And I can win the case, it's won so many cases so far. And the most interesting thing that happened, IBM's Watson 
actually went and made a movie trailer by taking all the scenes in the movie after it learned what is it that you want the audience to feel. They said, I want a horror movie trailer and the computer actually created a trailer out of all the scenes in the movie. So the world is fundamentally changing from what we It's just changing very, very rapidly, right? So if you actually think about it, there are way too many applications. And whenever you have so many applications, there are two sides to everything, right? So there's a good side and there's a bad side. Now, whoever talks about the good side, whoever is very good, obviously I'm on the good side, you can see that I'm very enthusiastic about all the happenings, talks about these kind of arguments, right? The argument is over the time, if you see the world, the output has gone up, the GDP has gone up, there's more money in the world, people are actually making a lot more money than they used to, the cost is going down, there's immense amount of variety of products, the quality is fantastic, it's just great, the innovation is all over the place, people are able to do things that they could never dream of in the past, right? So especially if you can save people's lives. What's not to like? It's just a great place to be in, right? And there's this other argument that actually says that over time technology has always disrupted people, it's always created problems, but humans have found a way to evolve. We found a way to add higher value and do greater work. So what's not to worry about? So there's this negative side of the equation, right? People who are actually not very happy about it think about it in a different way. How do they think about it? This is an idea that was actually presented by Andrew McAfee, one of the most famous economists from MIT, in a, in a TED talk actually. When he talks about how, over time, the profits that you make are actually rising steadily, but the money that's going to labor is actually decreasing. And what does that mean? Just think about that for a second. It means companies are making a lot of money, companies are making a lot of money, but all of that money is being pumped as capital into machines or automation. It's not going to labor. Which means people are not getting that money. People who are working are not getting that money. Right? So that can cause a lot of social discontent. There's a huge inequality problem there. Right? So it's a classic argument. The other argument are essentially obviously there are millions of jobs that are going to get killed. CNN claims that it's going to be 5 million jobs by 2020. Huge number, right? 5 million. Uh, a more pertinent example would be the American trucking industry where there are 3.5 million people. Worldwide there are about 8 million truckers. And if automated vehicles actually come on board and truckers come on board, 8 million people can lose their jobs. What does that mean? Right? How are you going to take care of it? Let's say that the jobs of the future are data science. Does, does that mean that you can take these 8 million people and immediately make them data scientists? You probably can't, right? So those are the arguments that people make go on the negative side. And this is an interesting thing, I think all of us should go and do this. So BBC has a website where you can actually go and put in the work that you do or you plan to do and it'll actually tell you what is the percentage probability that your job will be replaced by an automation. And it so comes out that uh, tele-sales reps and accountants have a 97% chance that their jobs are going to be eliminated very soon. So anybody in finance, accounting, I'm sorry. Right? So that's, that's kind of what the world is going to us. That's where it's, it's going, right? So a lot of automation, that's the negative side of the argument. But how are we going to solve these problems? So it's good to say that we have problems. How are we going to think about solving these problems? There are multiple ways to solve the problems. People are thinking about many things. There's this big concept of universal guaranteed income where we're saying that, okay, the world is going towards a place where uh, you know, machines are going to take over a lot of the work, people are going to be out of work, then maybe you don't work for money, you work for your skills. You're not paid for your time, you're actually paid for your skills. So you don't need to worry about money anymore. You're not working for income anymore. Maybe that's what is the future, right? So that's one of the thoughts. The other thoughts is you want to change the entire paradigm into building new skills. You want to change the underlying infrastructure. You want to teach people skills which they are not used to. Right? Like concentrate on cognitive skills more than quantitative skills, right? Uh, and then there's this concept of micro careers which is going on. Which is more like, uh, I mean it kind of happens today, think about it like a film studio. If you think about a film studio, they don't really have permanent employees. They just bring employees together who have price for their specific skills and they produce a great output and then they just disband. Right? So that's that's kind of what the world is going to do. It's micro -permits. No one will have one single job. You'll have many, many jobs that are going to do it. Which is all great, right? But I think there is a fundamental problem to all of this. These are all great big questions that we need to answer. But I think there is a bigger problem. The bigger problem, in my mind, is lack of engagement. I don't think if you actually consider all of the stuff that we spoke about, the magic of computing, the way the data is transforming our lives, artificial intelligence, how automation is taking over, I don't think there are enough of us actually being deliberate about participating in this transformation. We all want to be bystanders. Humans have this tendency to actually wait by the side and let the revolution pass. I don't think we can do that anymore. Especially because it's transforming. We have this innate want to actually be accepted, but we also have this laziness of not wanting to do anything about it, right? So that's not a choice anymore. Inaction is not an option anymore. We need to fundamentally participate in this conversation. We need to be deliberate about participation. So I actually implore each one of you to start thinking about what does this future world mean? 
What does it mean to you? What does it mean to your family? What does it mean to your friends? What does it mean to your future generations that are going to come? So I want all of us to engage, and I want all of us to engage very, very proactively and deliberately. Right? So when Shakespeare actually said this, uh, it used to be one of my favorite quotes, right? All world's a stage, and all the men or women are really players. Right? But I actually fundamentally disagree, disagree with this construct now. And the reason I disagree with this construct is because I don't think we are put on this earth just to be actors and something. I believe there's something more interesting happening. I believe that we're all creators, and I believe technology is that stage. And we have to use that stage of technology and write the play that we want to start. Nobody gets to decide what we get to do. We get to decide what we get to do. So I firmly believe that if we engage deliberately, proactively, and if we try to understand how we can make a difference in this world, the magic will continue, right? So as I said, let us go and make the magic happen. Thank you.